I would now like to talk about cooperative learning. Actually, in a sense, we have already spoken of cooperative learning and you will know as I introduce the concept to you. Cooperative learning is the process of breaking students into small groups so that they can discover a new concept together and help each other. So as far as breaking students into groups is concerned, uh, we have already spoken of the interview technique. That is a part of cooperative learning. The core of cooperative learning is for students to understand the positive effects of interdependence. That means working with each other in a harmonious way while underlining the importance of personal responsibility. In this format, students get the chance to work with each other for each other's success. But each other's success is only enabled if each student takes their specific responsibility very seriously. Apart from increasing knowledge about the subject, the experience of working socially with one's peers can help students with soft skills. Soft skills such as skills involved in interacting with other people, negotiating with other people, taking their opinions on board. One example of cooperative learning, which is quite famous, is the jigsaw technique. In this approach, groups of students work together in teams of four. And each team becomes an expert on one segment of the topic that has to be covered. So as you can see uh, in the jigsaw diagram on the left side, there are four groups of students. Students in group number one will work on one piece of knowledge. Similarly, students in group two, three and four will work on their distinct, their own distinct pieces of knowledge and will master that knowledge, of course, with their teacher's support. So each expert team is working on one particular segment. Once each group feels that they are comfortable with their material, then the groups are remade. They are rearranged to form new groups. As you can see, the group formation is the one on the right hand side of the diagram. One person from each group enters the new group. So the first group has people from the earlier group one earlier group 2, earlier group 3, and earlier group 4. Now within each group, the person from group 1 will teach the rest of the group what he or she mastered. The person who has joined from group 2 will teach the others what he or she mastered in the first group they were a part of. Similarly, three and four will also teach the others what they learned in their earlier groups. This way, students get to teach their expertise to their peers. In this, the teacher of course has to facilitate and ensure that what students learn in the first stage is appropriate, is suitable, is correct. And also that when they become teachers for others in round two, they are able to disseminate the learning in an adequate manner. So while in Jigsaw, the students are very, very active, the teacher has to play an even more active role to ensure that things are going smoothly. Now, Jigsaw is, of course, a technique that we will not be able to use in every class or every topic. But in the course of a semester, if we can have even two jigsaw exercises, I think it would be enjoyable for the students. For example, in political science, if you have to cover the foreign policy of four different countries, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, and Sri Lanka, in round one, uh, the foreign policy of Sri Lanka will be given to group one. The foreign policy of Pakistan will be given to group two. And similarly, the other two countries will be designated to the other two groups. Then in round two, members of each group will teach the other. 
In a case like this, and once or twice in the semester, the jigsaw technique can certainly be used with success for peer collaboration and peer learning. And psychology has shown again and again that peers are very important sources of learning. And a healthy way to learn is to learn from one's peers because you can question them far more than you can question any authority figure. You can argue and debate with them more easily than you can with an authority figure. So as far as the development of critical thinking skills are concerned, cooperative learning makes a lot of sense. Now, in the end, after sharing the advantages and examples of active learning strategies, I would also like to be a skeptic and identify some of the challenges that come in our way while we are attempting to use these strategies. Again, I would like to say that given the structure of our educational system, we cannot use active learning strategies all the time for every topic and every issue. Neither is every active learning strategy suitable for every subject. We have to pick and choose what is suitable for us in the time frames and the constraints within which we work. Now, what are the challenges that can come our way? First of all, lecturers are very strong in their fields and disciplines, but do not have any background or training in pedagogic methods. Even I was never given any training for active learning strategies. But if I do want to implement them and I do see benefits in them, there is a lot of wonderful material that is present online. It is quite self-explanatory. If we read that material, we will get a lot of ideas for active learning strategies appropriate for our classroom. So it's a matter of doing a good search on Google. And then really, like every other thing we learn, we will practice, implement, and learn on the job. The second challenge can be lack of time for preparation of active learning techniques. However, as I shared with you, the techniques do not necessarily require a lot of time or effort on our part. In fact, except for jigsaw, which does require a lot of time in terms of the guidance we give to students and the preparation that we see them doing, most of the activities can be done without too much preparation and in a short span of time. Another challenge could be a reluctance on our part to reduce the amount of material covered, which is perceived as necessary in order to use active learning methods. Active learning methods do take up some of your teaching time, not necessarily a lot of it, but some of it. So there may be a topic or two that you may have to request the students to study on their own so that you can have more space for discussions and collaborations in the classroom. That is a matter of negotiating with our students. And if they are comfortable doing one or two topics for self-study, that gives you a little more scope for applying active learning strategies in the classroom. Finally, the biggest challenge can be resistance to change, both from faculty and from students who are used to and expect to be taught in a certain way. Even if you are able to overcome that resistance, initially your students may be resistant. In such cases, it is still a good idea to go ahead with active learning strategies, but only after having a talk with your students, where you explain to them why you are introducing an active learning strategy. And also, after you try it out with the students, please take their feedback to see how they liked it. And of course, if they enjoyed it and saw benefit in it, it's a good idea to continue with those strategies. Else, you can revisit your plan and see what works best for your classroom. Ultimately, that is our call as teachers. With that, we wrap up today's session. We have mainly discussed what active learning is and how we can foster a culture of active learning in our classrooms while admitting that there are certain constraints in our for functioning and we must operate within those constraints. Thank you. And I do hope that today's session has been useful for you. It would have been wonderful to meet you in person and actually implement these active learning strategies amongst us.
yet this is the best that the present circumstances allow. I hope that you will be using some of these and I wish all of you very, very good luck in your teaching practice. Thank you.